All right, Phil Lee returning with another episode of Civil War Chat. Today is the 4th of January, 2021, Monday. Today's topic is electoral college fraud, and I'm speaking of during the Reconstruction era. Before, we get, before I get into that, let me point out in the upper right here, uh, if you'd like to be notified of future episodes of Civil War Chat, click the notification bell and you, you'll be automatically notified. Uh, before I get uh, started on my notes here, let me show you, you can get a lot of the information, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the information that's gonna be covered in today's talk comes from my book, um, U.S. Grants Failed Presidency. And it's $20 on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, $25 directly from me. If you live in the United States, I'll give you an autograph copy for $25 and cover the expense of mailing it to you. If you want it without the autograph copy, then you go to Amazon and Barnes and Noble and places like that is $20. I will, um, as I say, I'll cover the postage if you want it and you, if you live in the United States and you want it delivered, uh, an autograph copy delivered from me. One of the things that I wanted to emphasize is that a lot of today's historians have no hesitation at all. In fact, they're eager to accuse uh, white Southerners of the Reconstruction era of terrorism, meaning the KKK. What they never discuss is the fact that the carpetbag and scallywag regimes controlled the election apparatus and controlled the black uh, electorate vote. And they disfranchised whites in Arkansas, Tennessee, and a number of other states um, so that the, basically they were in control in, in the, uh, in, in the uh, southern states. They controlled the government. What Daniel Chamberlain, who was the last carpetbag governor of the state of South Carolina, even admitted 35 years later, he wrote an article for the Atlantic Monthly in April 1901 in which he said, look, I condemn the KK day. I condemn the violence that occurred by Southern whites during the Reconstruction era in South Carolina, as well as the rest of the South. But it was predictable. He said you could get anyone elected or that you wanted through bribery. You could get anyone thrown out of office through bribery. You could get any bill passed through bribery. You could get any bill blocked through bribery. That's how corrupt it was. Those governments had to end if there was if the, the South was to make any economic progress. It is a it is a lie that the carpetbaggers and scallywags had any interest in, in the blacks. No, they only wanted their votes. Uh, hopefully, there'll be an opportunity to, to debate some of these academics who claim otherwise, I've, I've issued a, a challenge to one of the most prominent ones of them and which he ignored, it's fine, it's fine. I don't have time to waste with them anyway, but I'm happy to do it if they want to debate. Okay, so let me get my notes out here. What I want to talk about is the electoral college fraud of the 1876 election, which was during the Re reconstruction era. About four o'clock in the morning following Tuesday's presidential election, in 1876, the New York Times received a request from two prominent Democrats for an update on the electoral, electoral college tally. Nobody ever replied. Instead, the editors and political writers sensed that if the Democrats were in doubt of the victory, even though both candidates, uh, Rutherford Hayes and Samuel Tilden, had assumed that the Democrats had won based upon the tallies that had been counted. The New York Times realized that if the Democrats were contacting them for an updated tally, that they were actually in doubt as to whether there was a Democrat victory for the presidential election. And so they reasoned if the leading Democrat politicians were privately uncertain, the New York Times reasoned perhaps the Republican loyal New York Times could transform their, those fears by the Democrats into a reality through creative reporting in, to, in the morning's first edition. In other words, New York Times was saying, hey, this looks uncertain. 
But as a media outlet, as a media power, we can change the narrative. We can make this uh, an election that is uncertain, even though the results appear to be a convincing win, certainly in the popular vote by Samuel Tilden and in the electoral vote. We can change the whole narrative so that this entire election becomes doubtful. It, how's this different than what the media is doing today? How's this different than what the media did in 2020? Or actually during Trump's entire presidency? New York Times is basically showing that this is an old, old trick. Anyway, let, let me continue. A once insane Republican leader may have indirectly provided the basis for partial newspapermen at the New York Times, for example, to rationalize putting a biased interpretation on the front page. Years earlier, Daniel Sickles was the first person to win acquittal for murder by using a temporary insanity defense after killing his wife's lover. Shortly before midnight on election day, 1876, he sent telegrams to Republican controlled machines in Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida, which were the only three carpetbag regimes remaining. He emphasized that Republican Rutherford B. Hayes would win the 1876 election against Democrat Samuel Tilden if each of the three states, Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina, delivered their electoral votes to Hayes. Tilden would lose the electoral college by, despite holding a 51 to 48% popular vote majority. Now there was one disputed vote in an Oregon that the Republicans would have to get as well, but they, had a, they, they knew they had a good shot at getting that. Okay, perhaps due to uh, Dan Sickles' earlier telegrams, the Times learned of rumors that the returns from the three Southern states might be contested. As a result, the first edition of the New York Times declared the election in doubt. Okay, there was no, nobody at Twitter or YouTube or someplace saying, you can't do that. Even though that's exactly what the New York Times did. They created a story that said this election is in doubt. A front page editorial arbitrarily put South Carolina and Louisiana in the Republican column, thereby giving Hayes the lead. Thus began America's most notorious election fraud. Regardless of the true vote, the returns from each of the carpetbag states would be determined by Republican controlled returning boards, which launched investigations into the legitimacy of the popular votes in each of the applicable states. Although fraudulent votes were cast on both sides, it was nearly certain that the returning boards would throw out enough Democrat votes to provide a fabricated Republican majority in each of the carpetbag states, thereby giving the election to Hayes. What difference does it make what the real votes are as long as the returning boards count the votes and the returning boards are controlled by the carpetbaggers? I mean, what difference? You know, the modern historians don't discuss that. The academic historians ignore that. Instead, they focus on, oh, well, the KKK was all terrorists. Well, what about these damned returning boards that were controlled by the carpetbaggers. You know, do, what difference does it make how the people voted when the returning board says, we're gonna count the votes and we're Republicans. Uh, let me continue. The eventual fraudulent electoral vote was 185 for Hayes and 184 for Tilden. Thus Rutherford, who at the time when many people called Ruther fraud, uh, became president. Tilden, even though Tilden needed only one of the disputed states to come down in his column. And he probably, he, he may well have deserved all three, but certainly Louisiana was, the, the, the true vote in Louisiana was in his favor, certainly. 
According to historian Roy Morris, quote, the actions of the returning boards would not bear close scrutiny. Any reasonably impartial board was likely to reverse the findings, particularly in Louisiana, close quote. Since the electoral vote roll call was postponed until days before the new president took uh, president's inauguration, Democrats threatened to filibuster before the roll call was completed, thereby preventing Hayes from taking office. Anticipating the maneuver, Republicans responded by secretly hinting to take two actions that would provide Southern Democrats incentives to stay out of the filibuster. So let me just provide some context here. In those days, the president was inaugurated in early March, not mid-January, early March. So there was quite a wait from the election in October, November to early March. And all this time, this thing was in dispute. But uh, the Republicans went after uh, some of the Southern Democrats with proposals to convince them to not participate in the filibuster that would prevent uh, Rutherford Hayes from becoming president. And here's the first thing. First uh, was to, the, here's the first thing they decided to do, was to withdraw federal occupation troops from Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. From one perspective, the action removed federal military protection for black voters. And that, of course, is what all the academics are so focused on. But from the other perspective, it denied the carpet bang rulers an arbitrary tool for blocking democratic white voters. Again, as long as the Carpet baggers controlled the election returning boards. They controlled the election. Now, academic historians today, they don't talk about that. Regardless of whether or not it was a secret promise that Hayes made to the Southerners in Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida, he did remove the federal troops shortly after being put into office. A second incentive that the Republicans promised the Southerners was to provide more federal public work spending in the South, particularly for railroads. From 1865 to 1873, for example, the states of the former Confederacy received less than 10% of federal public work spending. Massachusetts and New York alone got more than twice as much money for federal public work spending than did all of the former 11 Confederate states, notwithstanding the greater need in the South. Whether or not such action was a second secret promise, it was never fulfilled. Southerners were told that, quote, the great barbecue, close quote, originating with the 1863 Pacific Railroad Act was over. They were told it had been ended because of the economic depression that followed the panic of 1873, which was partially caused by liberal government railroad subsidies elsewhere, meaning the North and the West. That financial panic was started when the investment bank of Jay Cook and Company collapsed in September, 1873, the very day that that company failed to meet its obligations. President Ulysses Grant was a house guest and having breakfast at the breakfast table of Jay Cook in Philadelphia. Jay Cook was a major political contributor to President Grant. His company failed. It sent the, United, the entire United States into a depression um, President Grant was a house guest there overnight the very day that that company failed. Democrat governors, and as a result of that failure, you know, they, they reneged on their promise to provide any uh, uh, federal aid to the uh, economies in the southern states. Democratic governors soon replaced carpetbag Republicans in the three disputed southern states. 
But Hayes arranged appointments of the former GOP governors and other state officials who helped him win the election. Okay, let's keep in mind, there were returning boards in Louisiana, South Carolina, Florida, and the governors of those states were all Republicans. So Louisiana's 1876 gubernatorial candidate was given a federal appointment as U.S. counsel to Liverpool. And the outgoing governor of that state who signed the returns that were sent to Washington, moved up to the U.S. Senate. He became a senator in a deal arranged by Ohio Senator John Sherman, who was the brother of General William T. Sherman, a great buddy of Ulysses Grant. Notorious buddy. <clears throat> the four, two of them white and two of them black, members of Louisiana's election returning board were given federal jobs. One of the white men was appointed the chief customs collector in New Orleans, which was the biggest port in the South. And the other became his assistant. Now, tax collection posts were notoriously corrupt in those days. Money was collected, some of it stuck to the fingers of the collector and then was passed on to uh, the government for whatever the government was going to use it for. One of the blacks on the returning board became a deputy naval officer at the Port of New Orleans, and the other got a customs house post for his brother. In total, in total, 69 men involved in the Republican winning Louisiana count got federal appointments. 69, nearly 70 men involved in getting that Louisiana vote switched from Democrat to Republican, got federal job appointments. In all, some 50 relatives and friends of the Louisiana Returning Board got positions at the New Orleans Customs House. After Hayes, now I'm focusing on Louisiana because even though he, uh, uh, Tilden may well have won in Florida and in South Carolina, it's pretty clear that he really did win in Louisiana. After Hayes's 1876 election, Washington Republicans virtually ignored the black electorate until the eve of the tightly contested reelection campaign of President Benjamin Harrison against Democrat Grover Cleveland in 1892. Anticipating a close vote, now this is now, let me just continue. Anticipating a close vote, in 1890, Massachusetts Representative Henry Cabot Lodge introduced a force bill to empower the federal government to supervise elections in the South, once again, under the glitter of federal bayonets, thereby optimizing Republican election prospects in the region. So once again, here it is. Well, it's going to be a close election. Let's uh, send federal, federal troops down there and to ensure that the votes uh, go Republican, basically is what he's saying. Of course, that's not the way historians present it. No, he was just going down. He wanted to have these federal troops just go down there to ensure that the elections were fair. Yeah, you get fair elections when you go to the, to the, uh, the polling booth and you see federal troops with bayonets. Yeah, right? Well, if you believe that, you'll believe anything. And, and, the, and unfortunately, students in our academic uh, institutions do. They do believe that. And of course, they do believe anything. The bill, however, was dropped. That force bill that Massachusetts Henry Cabot Lodge wanted to introduce to ensure that, that uh, Republican Benjamin Harrison would become president again. That bill was dropped when the Republicans traded it away for Southern support of the McKinley tariff, which raised import duties to 50%. So there's a, there's a, that, that's important. The North wanted high protective tariffs. They were willing to sacrifice the interest of blacks anywhere to get it. Although the Republicans claimed the Lodge bill underscored the party's determination to protect voters, 
the mo that motive was evidently less powerful than their hunger for higher tariffs. But that's another story and a good one. Yeah, I, I could go and explain more about tariffs, but I don't want to make this talk too long. So I don't know if I mentioned, click the notification bell in the upper right if you want to be notified of uh, future episodes of Civil War Chat. And once again, thanks for watching, thanks for attending, and I'll see you next time.